Uh, so um, I think there's some intentionality and purposefulness in, in, in having Christ abide in our lives. Uh, I think in what, what I mean by that is, um, well, it's, it's easy to, uh, to have a relationship with, with our Lord and Savior when things are going well. Um, when things get tough, though, um, we kind of fall to, uh, I'd say, different uh, different life skills and experiences to to respond. And so, unless we've been uh, intentional about our developing and maintaining a relationship with Jesus, uh, we can sometimes miss the mark in, in, in the way we respond to the challenges of our life. And you know, I'm, I'm reminded by uh, and, uh, the, the verses in James. Uh, Chapter one, it tells us to count it as joy uh, when the trials of this life, um, uh, you know, when we face the trials of this life. Uh, and it's, it's how, how do you face trials with joy? And you know, again, unless you've been intentional about having a relationship with God. So really, how do you have a relationship with God? Uh, well, first, first and foremost, I think you've got to remember that uh, we were we were created for a relationship with God. And we, we put so many things in in the way of that. So. Um, we've got to be intentional about spending time with, with our Lord. So, so what do we do with that time that we're making for the Lord? Or we, uh, and how do we how do we spend that time? I think obviously you know, prayer is, is where I have to start. You know, uh, uh, spending time with with the Lord in prayer. He you know he's he's our Father. Uh, I've got children of my own, and uh, you know I want to spend time with them. Um, and you know sometimes they don't have time for me, and I, I get it. You know they've got kids of their own in some cases, but. I miss them when they're not around. Um, I think our Father misses us when we're not around. So um, I think spending time with the Lord in prayer, spending time with the Lord in, in, uh, in His Word. I mean, this is the, the Word of God. The very Word that He used to speak creation into existence uh, is presented to us in the form of His Holy uh, Bible. Uh, we need to spend some time in that Word and let it work on our hearts, have it written on our hearts that we um, might not sin against God. One of the other things that I, I try to do uh, is to practice gratitude, um, being thankful to the Lord for all that He has done, all that He's going to do, and continues to do through me uh, and, and through others, uh, and uh, to, to the glory of God. Um, I think uh, so many of us forget that uh, uh, um, our salvation, while it's it's free to us, came at such a tremendous price uh, to the Lord that our salvation alone is through uh, faith alone in Christ alone for God's glory alone. And, and um, we, we did nothing to deserve it. Uh, and we, we need to understand that what it cost Jesus uh, for that. Uh, and we need to be grateful and have gratitude. And, and again, you know, as, as I said earlier, having, uh, being thankful when things are going well is easy. Being thankful when things are going difficult uh, is, is harder if you haven't prepared your heart, if you're not intentional about having that relationship with God, uh, such that you can get through those difficult times. Uh, you know, so many people uh, think that, you know, being a Christian, you know, gives you a pass from, from hard stuff, uh, and far from it. And no doubt God has blessed me immeasurably. Um, I have a, a wonderful church, a, a great family, a good job, an amazing wife that stood by me uh, through good times and, and, and life challenges. Uh, and God has made his presence uh, in my life known through all of those situations. But um, it, it's, again, easy uh, to, to be thankful to the Lord in, in those kinds of circumstances. But one, one, one thing that comes to mind uh, that where, where God really revealed himself uh, in my life uh, was about 15 years ago when, when our son was injured in a, in a, in a pretty uh, severe uh, accident. Uh, it was hard as a parent. Uh, even though he was grown and, and married at the time, newly married at that, um, it's hard to hear a doctor say your son may never walk again. You know, it could be it would have been easy to shake our fist at God and be mad at God. How could he do something like that to a kid that's helping to lead a church camp? <laughs> uh, but. Um, yeah, our church family uh, came along beside us, poured out their love on us. Um, we had a fellowship. <laughs> uh, 
lunch, dinner, I can't remember now, uh, where, where we had great barbecue and friends and song, uh, just to lift our spirits. We had friends. Uh, our pastor that made the nearly three hour drive to Tyler, Texas to sit alongside of us. And, uh, yeah, and walk that, uh, walk that journey with us. You know, it, uh, you know, with Fran and Jay, Donnie, Sandy. Yeah, again, uh, just just holding our hands, loving us through it. You know, the peace and the and the comfort that came from that um, was just not something that um, the world had to offer. But that that was only through Jesus Himself. Uh, that, Again, that outpouring of love from the church family. I, I just don't know how uh, people get by without a relationship with God to count on in those difficult times. I'd be willing to bet if I if I took a if I took a survey this morning, um, that and just ask the question. Are you happy? It would probably be 50-50. Some of you, life is good. There's no real issues going on. And then some of you are on the other side of that where it feels like life is caving in on your chest. And your answer to, to the question, are you happy, is very different in those circumstances, isn't it? Right? If everything's going good, yeah, we're happy. It's fine. But if everything's not going well, are you happy? Um, no. And my fear for, for a lot of us is that we've mistaken happiness and joy as being the same thing. Happiness is an emotion that is based upon external factors. Joy is internal. And it comes regardless of what's happening externally. And, and I think somewhere in our Americanized world and an Americanized um, version of Christianity, we have said that I have to be happy. And nowhere in Scripture does God guarantee that you and I are going to be happy. But he does say that we can have joy and the fullness thereof. So they're drastically different. So then the question becomes not are you happy? The question becomes do you have joy? And I think for a lot of us, that's kind of a hard question because it's like, I don't know the difference, and that's okay. It's okay, because that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Because the invite from Jesus this morning is for us to know joy. The invite is for us to know joy. In John chapter 15, and, and we're going to kind of start at the back, because I think it's, it, we have to understand it from the, the back point. In verse 11 of chapter 15, Jesus says this, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus says, hey, I've said these things to you so that your, my joy may be in you and that joy may be full. So then you have to ask the question, well, what are these things Jesus said? So that this may happen. Right? He says, hey, here's, here's what I'm saying. These are the things that, that I'm saying 
in order that you may have joy. So he's laying it out for us on how his joy may be in us and it may be full. How many of you are like, hey, I want joy? Okay, good. Some of you are like, eh, I'm not sure. Can we wait till the end? So Jesus says, hey, here's what it means to have joy. So then now we go back to John 15, starting in verse 1. And Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that they may be bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus says here, I am the true vine. So what, what does that mean? Our first point this, this morning is that joy is found in the vine. And Jesus says this, I am the true vine. It's Jesus' seventh I am statement in the book of John. Dakota mentioned that earlier as he read from John 14. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is, that's the sixth one. Now we've entered the seventh, the final I am statement of Jesus. So what do those mean? Those, those are Jesus declaring who he is and the truth of who he is. Okay. And in this moment, Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. Well, well, how many of you daily deal with grape vineyards? I didn't think so, right? Good. I didn't think you did. It's okay. I, listen, I don't know a whole lot of, about growing grapes. I know that if you plant them, it takes like seven years on average to, for them to produce grapes that are viable to make wine. Fun fact. It's about all I know. So I called a grape vineyard. I said, hey, talk to me. Tell me all the things. And so I just listened. And I learned lots of things. I learned how they prune and why they prune. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But, but I learned lots of things. But also one of the things that I learned in, in all of this and discussing is that why would Jesus say, I am the true vine? And how is joy found in him? Well, listen, in Isaiah chapter 5 God says this of Israel for the, in chapter five, Isaiah 5, verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. God, over and over in the Old Testament, God describes Israel as being the, vi- the vineyard. That, 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 that there's this, this picture being painted of the house of Israel. And so when Jesus comes in and says, I am the true vine, what Jesus is saying is that I'm the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecy. I am the fulfillment of the culmination of the house of Israel and what God is doing. He says, I'm it. I am the true vine. I am the one. I'm here. And so that was huge. But but listen, in historical context here, the, the vine is a big deal to Israel, okay? It, it, we know if we go back and you do research and look at historical books, and I read a lot in the last couple of weeks on this, is that during the intertestamental time, which is the 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, that's what we typically refer to his, historically as the Maccabean period, okay? During the Maccabean period, um, uh, the Jews' coins, their money, um, had a vine, a grapevine, stamped on them. Why? Because it was a picture of who Israel was. God had declared them the vineyard. So they took, they, it was a big deal to them. And uh, going into the gates of the temple at the same time period, um, the gate was ornate. And it was, it was all covered in grapevines. And wealthy Jews would oftentimes donate money to make it more ornate. And they would donate money for, for jewels to be put in place of grapes. And it was this ornate thing. And, and, and so, so what's going on here is Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. I am the fulfillment of all of this. Because here's the deal. Joy's found in him. 
Joy's found in the vine. And why that's important for us is because the, the grapevine, right, on the temple gate, anytime someone who wasn't a Jew wanted to, 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 to worship in a Jewish way and come to the Jewish God, there was a list of things they had to do. Circumcision, all of these things. Circumcision, you had to obey the law to the T. You had to offer sacrifices. You had to do all of these things to have your sins forgiven on a regular basis, right? It's Old Testament law. They were still practicing. Jesus comes in and says, I am the true vine. Joy, peace is found in me. Because then Jesus is going to go on in just a minute and he's going to say this, okay? Those who remain in me, not the list of rules, not the list of things that I have to do to to, to be considered this. No, no, no. If you remain in me, it's a big deal. Jesus says, I, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. And then he says, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Listen, joy is found in him, and he calls himself the vine. Joy is found in him. So, so what does that mean for you and me? Well, for those of you here this morning that don't know Jesus, that have never put your faith or trust in him, first step is to do that, is to acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior, to acknowledge that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, and then he was hung on a cross to die for your sins and for mine, and then he was put in a tomb, and three days later he walked out of that tomb, declaring victory over death so that we may have life. So listen, joy is found in him, and the first step of that is to step into relationship with him. To admit to him that you're a sinner and say, yes, God, you are the Savior that I need, and you put your trust in him. You will not have joy until that step is completed. Because joy is found in him. Well, the second thing is this, is that joy is found when we remain. When we remain, listen to what it says. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much proof and fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have, lo- have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Your, your, my Bible says abide. Your Bible may say remain or stay. For us as believers, those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus, joy is found in remaining. What does that mean? I, I think we kind of sometimes um, are confused by that word remain. Aren't we? How many of you ever told your kids, stay? (laughs) And then you're like, is it going to happen? Like we treat them like a dog sometimes. Like, stay, stay, right? And when we tell our kids to stay, what are we telling them? Don't move, right? (laughs) Don't move. Whatever you do, don't move. And we hear the word abide, we hear the word remain, and we think, I'm going to do nothing. 
I'm going to stay right here, and I ain't doing nothing. And so then that, what happens, is that translates into us in our Christian walk, because we define and we understand and remain as being, stay put, that if I just show up to church on Sundays, I've remained, I've stayed, I'm, I'm going to church, I'm doing that thing. And we think we're somehow remaining in him. And that's not at all what it's communicating. Because Jesus goes on and he says, hey, those of you that remain in me or abide in me, what happens is this, you bear fruit. And we get that confused too. We'll talk about that in just a second. But, but to remain in Jesus, to abide in him, is intentional. Just like Jerry said, it's intentional. There's got to be intentionality with it. Jesus has already said, what? You've been made clean by the word that I've spoken to you. Guess what? The way that you and I remain, the way that we find joy in the remaining, is staying in God's word. If the only time that you're reading the word of God is on Sunday mornings, you're not remaining. You're doing very as, as little as possible and hoping it works. And then you wonder why when life crumbles, you don't have joy. Remaining in him means that you're connected to his word. That you're right here. And what does it say to me? Every single moment of every single moment day when we remain in Jesus we remain in him there's joy to be found in him man there's joy there's so much joy just spending time with the father every day there's so much joy in that and Jesus says hey I've spoken these things that you may have your joy my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full He's saying remain in me abide in me stay connected to the vine right a, a, a branch listen I told you I learned lots of things a branch that's connected to the to the to the vine um, from the vine, the, the main section of the vine, into the branch flows what you and I call sap. Okay? And that sap brings forth nutrients so that that branch then can thrive and grow and then begin to produce what? Fruit. Right? But if that branch is not attached to the vine, there's no nutrients coming through the branch. So therefore, the branch cannot do what? Bear fruit. I didn't know that that's what sap did. I thought sap was just something that I picked on off of trees when I was a kid, and then I couldn't pull my fingers apart. Like, <laughs> anybody else? Maybe? Just me? Okay. Okay. Well, I learned something this week. Maybe you did too. Maybe you didn't. So, but listen, that, that's what it does. It brings forth nutrients. Listen to me, church. You want to remain in Jesus? You want joy to be in your life? You've got to have the nutrients being constantly poured into you. This life will beat you up. This world will... We'll, we'll dangle shiny things that, that, that they say are going to make you happy all day, every day. If you are not plugged into the vine, if you are not spending daily time with the Father, you will not produce fruit. What, what, what is that, Brady? I don't know. Produce some fruit? Like, what is going on? I don't even understand this language. Listen, I think sometimes... We think fruit, and, and, and I think the church has done this, and I think just because of Christian lingo and things like that, um, we can talk all day about that. But listen, we oftentimes say, well, 
they're not producing any fruit. And oftentimes what we mean by that in church, and I don't think we mean it in a, in a mean way. I don't think we mean it in a judgy way. It's just kind of how we talk sometimes. Anybody ever talk like Christian and then other people are like, what are you talking about? Nobody? Okay. Maybe I just went to a Christian school and whatever. But we, we talk things and like, oh, they're not producing any fruit. And what we really mean by that is they haven't led anybody to the Lord. Right? Have you ever, have you ever made it, let anybody the Lord, oh, you're not producing fruit? Time out. That's not what Scripture says when we talk about fruit. Okay? What, we, what Scripture says is the fruit of the Spirit is what? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things, as we abide in Him, that are produced in us, which then affect others which then helps us lead them to the Lord you see how that works two of you did so listen this is how this happens right we remain in Jesus in his word and that produces in us love joy peace patience kindness gentleness and self-control that's a big one for a lot of us that ending one Right? That in us is produced in such a way that it goes out and it affects those around us for the gospel. They go, hey, why do you respond with kindness all the time? Well, because of Jesus. Why, why are you so quick to love people? Because of Jesus. Why, why, why do you practice self-control when people always get up in your face? Because of Jesus. You see how that works? So the fruit of the Spirit then produces fruit for the kingdom. It's a process. It's a cycle that happens. And that's what Jesus means when he says, abide in me, and here's what will happen. But listen, he gives some stern warnings in here too. Those that don't produce fruit, they do what? They cut them off. Throw them in the fire. Whoa, 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 preacher. Listen, he says it. What fruit is your life producing? If you've stepped in a relationship with Jesus, but most of your Christian life you've been cruising and not remaining, I would be willing to bet there's very little fruit being produced in you and around you. That's what God's word says. If you don't remain, no fruit will be produced. If you don't remain, no nutrients come your way. Therefore, you will not produce fruit. But Jesus also says something really interesting at the beginning of this. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes. That it may, that does bear fruit, he prunes. That it may bear more fruit. The third thing is this, is that joy is found in pruning. It's like, oh no. None of us like pain, do we? But is pain necessary? Yeah, it is. Pain, pain teaches us so much. I help coach Briggs' little football team, and I tell our kids all the time, it's like, hey, you, they, they get frustrated when we have to correct them because they're not doing something right or whatever. And I tell them, it's like, look, you learn more in the failing than you ever do in the success. And, and, and so it goes with the pruning in us, right? As I talk to the, the, the um, um, they're actually called a viticulturist, just for those of you that are, I probably messed that up, didn't say it right, but that's how it's spelt, so correct me later, okay? Um, it's the vine dresser. It's the person who takes care of the vineyard, okay? They, they have like three processes of pruning grapevines, okay? Um, the, the first process is they come in and they, they clip away everything that's bad, okay? Um, and, and, and they get the vine ready for growth, for the new year, for the new season. And they, they trim away, and, 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 and as I talked to the viticulturists, they told me this, it's like, it sometimes looks as though, like, 
the plants, the vine's dead and looks like nothing's on it. And you're like, this is the worst vineyard ever. And I'm like, okay. And like, it, just because the way that we prune sometimes makes it look completely bare. But what it's doing is this. It's creating space and it's creating, um, and it's allowing the, the, the vine to produce better than it did the season before. But okay. So, so then there's the next um, um, uh, pruning section, and that's called topping. And as, 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 the, as the plant, as the vine produces um, the, the first um, uh, little, what seems to be um, fruit, they, they clip it. They clip the top of it off. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. I said, why do you do that? I said, because if we don't, then it won't produce to its fullest extent. Okay, well, that's fascinating. So then there's a third level. And the third level, they, I think she called trimming. I could be wrong. But it's, it's when the clusters begin to form and they look full. They go in and they pick out fruit and they get rid of it. I'm like, why do you do that? Like, why, why are you picking out what seems to be, on, on my untrained eye, what seems to be good? He said, because if we don't, it stops growing. And so what we have to do is we pick out all the things that look good, but we know, hey, if we pick these things out, what happens is it gets fuller and fuller. And now the, the vine has produced to its fullest extent. <clears throat> My mind was racing. It's like, what? This is so cool. Because what does God do, right? He prunes you and I in such a way so that we produce what? To the fullest extent. So that, so that fruit comes out of us so that his joy may be in us and that joy may be what? Full. So whatever you're walking through right now, the Lord may be pruning you to produce more. Whatever you're walking through right now also may be due because of the sin in your life. So let's not get those things confused. But sometimes we got to take a step back and go, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? And oftentimes the answer is, I'm making you look more like me. So that fruit may be produced. So you know how to have joy? You gotta know the vine. You gotta remain in the vine, but you also joy is found in the pruning. Jerry kind of stole my ending, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say it anyway. One of the one of the best ways for you and I to practice joy on a regular basis is to express gratitude and to rejoice over what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Charles Spurgeon says this, I do not think the church rejoices enough. We all grumble enough and groan enough, but very few of us rejoice enough. Do you have joy? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that you would just use it, Father, to sit in our hearts, to make us mindful, Father, that we would be intentional with our time. Father, we ask this morning that as we draw to a close of this time, Father, we wouldn't rush out of here. We, we would just take some moments to reflect, to respond to your invite to joy. God, we love you. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen.